like to introduce Mike Moffat. Mike is a well-known economist uh, uh, and writer who has a special interest in innovation and its impacts on society. Uh, he currently serves uh, at the Government of Canada, his first ever Chief Innovation Fellow, uh, where he's tasked uh, by the government to advise on the design and implementation of Canada's innovation agenda. He's also an assistant professor in the Business Economics and Public Policy Group at the Ivy Business School. And, and Mike will uh, respond to Daron's uh, talk, uh, and then the two of them will have a conversation uh, on these black chairs, followed by a Q as an A's. Mike, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you uh, for having me here. It's uh, a bit flattering and, and humbling uh, to be discussing uh, economics with one of my intellectual heroes at uh, an event honoring one of my intellectual heroes. So, uh, so thank you. Uh, and, and thank you for, for walking us through this historical context. I think this is very important, that we often think of these issues as being new, but they're not wholly new. I mean, we've been dealing with these uh, since uh, ancient Greece, as we saw. And I think that historical context is important for policymakers as we try and figure out how we should be responding to these challenges. So in my role as Chief Innovation Fellow, uh, there are two things that keep me up at night. There are two things that I worry about. The first is, what if our efforts are in vain? that we simply, no matter what we try to do, we can't move the needle in innovation. You know, what happens if we fail? And we could fail because nothing happens, or we could fail for a variety of other reasons. So I'm reminded of a, uh, last year, Microsoft decided uh, that it was going to use machine learning to teach a bot how to, to chat like a teenage girl. So they decided to put this bot on Twitter the next day, the very next day, the Telegraph newspaper had the headline, Microsoft deletes teen girl AI after it became a Hitler-loving sex robot within 24 hours. <laughs> so, you know, these things can sort of blow up for a variety uh, of reasons. And I think the first reason is don't put bots on Twitter. Um, but the second thing that, that, that keeps me up at night is what if our efforts work too well? What if, in fact, uh, that Canada's innovation performance takes off, that we, we make all the right moves and, and Canada becomes very innovative? Are we equipped as a country and a, as a government to, to deal with those side effects? You know, what happens if we succeed? And we know that there are a great deal of benefits uh, or potential benefits to innovation. There are societal benefits, health benefits, environmental benefits. Uh, but being an economist, I'm going to focus on the economic benefits. Now, as Dora mentioned, you know, there are a few ways to, to generate economic growth. The first way is just through capital accumulation, you know, more, more factories, more machines, more equipment. Another way is to simply increase the size of the labor force, and we, we've done that over the last 40 years as we've got more and more women in, into, uh, into the labor force in larger numbers. You know, but basically throwing more inputs uh, into the economy. Or we could figure out how to produce more uh, with the same. So either more widgets or more valuable widgets with the same level of inputs. In the uh, crude language of growth accounting, uh, we call this total factor productivity or multi-factor productivity. Really, most of, most of that is essentially innovation. And that's how we get sustained long-term economic growth, uh, is through that type of innovation, is figuring out how to increase our total factor productivity. But that, in so doing, we create economic rents, or we create economic profits that go beyond what's needed uh, to cover opportunity costs. So, you know, Jean-Peter talked about this quite a deal, in the, uh, quite a lot in the 1940s, but these ideas actually go back at least to Karl Marx, if not, not sooner. The idea is that when we create innovations, we create those economic rents uh, through some kind of uh, creation of economic power. So Jean-Peter talked about the fact that if you have an innovation, it, it takes a while for uh, your competitors to figure out how to duplicate you, duplicate that, so that gives you some uh, deal of market power for a while. Or that market power could come from regulations. It could come from intellectual property laws that uh, 
you know, we, we give, uh, you know, this temporary market power in, in a way to compensate uh, innovators for those innovations and, and recognize that innovation has a positive externality. So we've heard uh, through the talk the distributional effects that innovation can have on employment through both enabling technologies and sustaining technologies. Uh, but we also have to think about the, the, this issue of economic rents or the, the, the economic gains uh, from innovation because those are going to have distributional effects as well. And often they're positive. They're not necessarily something we need to be afraid of. Innovation can increase the demand for labor, as, as, as we've seen in certain cases. It can lower the price of goods. Uh, it, can, uh, it can generate more tax revenues uh, for governments uh, to spend on, on social programs and, and training. However, those rents can also flow disproportionately to the wealthy, whether to be owners of capital, very high skilled labor, you know, C-level executives, uh, well-connected workers, or so on. As well, economic rents uh, could also flow to landowners, which we've seen in some of our more innovative geographic clusters across North America, like in Silicon Valley. So any government grappling with innovation must also worry about those distributional impacts, must also worry about how to make that innovation inclusive in an economic sense, in a social sense, in a health sense, but also in an ability to contribute uh, to innovation systems, that are we allowing everyone in our economy to be innovative and to uh, to contribute to uh, innovative activities. So that's where I'm going to uh, start our question. So we're going to uh, discuss for a few minutes and then we'll open it up to the floor and uh, get some of your questions. So I'm basically, is this mic gonna be on now? Okay, so I'm, I'm basically going to get you to do my job for me. Uh, how, do we, how do we deal with this tension uh, between the need to innovate, you know, to generate total factor productivity, to generate economic growth, but also the need to be inclusive? I think that's a great question. I don't think anybody knows the answer fully well. But I think generally the gains from innovation accrue in two different ways. One is that once we have a new widget, and start using that, that's going to change profits, it's going to change wages, and that's what I was talking about in terms of enabling and replacing technology. And I think there is a lot of difficulty in dealing with these technologies because many of them are of this replacing nature. The second is, which you have rightly pointed out and I had omitted, which is that the people who create the technologies are also getting some rents. And, uh, and that's very important. Mm -hmm. In most cases, quantitatively, it's smaller than what it does to the entire production process, and that's why I had not put as much emphasis on it. But you're absolutely right, and in the age of uh, digital technologies, sometimes it's quite interwoven with, with what's going on. So in some sense, Google is both an innovation company and, and it, it is producing things such as uh, ad services, advertisement, uh, search, uh, products or other information services. So the two are not easy to separate from each other. And I think in both cases, there is no easy formula to say we're going to make the uh, outcome of innovation an inclusive one, precisely because we're not anymore, if we ever were, in the land of enabling technologies. But if that's the case, we need to start thinking about policy as an additional lever in order to increase the shared nature of the prosperity that new technologies bring. And for that, I think uh, we need to have a longer conversation. I don't know how much of it I want to start now, but let me sort of uh, mention sort of uh, three elements, uh, and some of those perhaps we can come back to later. The first one is we need to make sure that these technologies are implemented in the right way so that they improve productivity. So as I already emphasized, a lot of things flow from productivity. If 
we are not able to implement the technologies because of regulation, because of absence of key types of personnel that are necessary, because of monopolies that prevent them, then we're not going to get the productivity benefits and we're going to be hampered by it. So for example, in the robotics area, you know, the US is squeezed in two ways, and uh, the, the same is perhaps true of Canada. You know, as opposed to other technologies in the digital era, like the ones represented by Facebook, or Google, Microsoft, and the, some of the hardware technologies, US is actually not a producer of robotics. Mm -hmm. So they are fairly behind in the most advanced applications of robotics, but on the other hand, they're also using them in various different ways that are creating pressure on labor. So, so it's just a question of how do you best exploit them. And I think you need to be for countries like Canada mm -hmm. and the United States, you really need to be at the forefront of these new technologies, including robotics. The second, is uh, the, the point I made about complementary skills. Mm. If we have the complementary skills to new technologies, we both soften the blow of them because they're going to have less of a displacing role, and we can then create wage growth for the workers that have the complementary skills. But here, and this is the one that requires mm. a bigger conversation, mm. is that we really have no clue because I think we haven't started having the informed knowledge-based discussion of what are the skills that new technologies require. Mm -hmm. The United States and many other countries are putting a lot of emphasis on STEM, and I'm totally happy with that. That's my favorite subject too. But is it really the numeracy skills that are in shortage when we look at the rollout of the AI and robotics? If the workers on the factory floor of Ford and GM had better numeracy skills, they would not have lost their jobs? It's not clear. When it comes to AI, it's even more complex because many of the things that AI is going to do is going to require some sort of a human agent to input information and to market and customize those products. So that might require not just numeracy skills, but a whole host of communication skills, soft skills, and various other things. It might also require very much adaptability and flexibility, things that our schooling system is not very good at, uh, uh, at, at, at instilling in the students. So we need to start measuring what are the complementary skills and start having a conversation about how to change our labor market institutions, including training systems, in order to enable workers, if it's possible at all, if it's before they are too, if it's too late, to make the transition to having, but more importantly, for our students to start investing in the right sorts of skills and acquire the flexibility, adaptability, and the complementary skills. But even that is not enough. There is no guarantee that, uh, you know, displacing the, the replacing technologies are going to uh, lift all boats if you, only you invest in complementary skills you also need to start thinking more seriously about how can we do a better job in terms of our fiscal system and social safety net in order to distribute the gains from, uh, from new technologies. And I think here we have some sort of uh, uh, encouraging signs that people are discussing things like universal basic income and other ways of redistributing resources. And, and I don't think universal basic income is necessarily a great idea, but I think having the conversation about a better redistribution system is very much necessary. Having a better discussion about social safety net, a social safety net that's not only ensures people and their children against adverse labor income shocks, but also prepares them for uh, being reintegrated into the labor market. I think those are very important things. But uh, the tendency, of course, in many countries is in the opposite direction. And the uh, US already has a very weak social safety net and is further cutting it down. And in many countries, because of uh, budget deficits and, uh, and fiscal uh, squeeze, uh, those, those social safety nets are in danger. So I think there needs to be a renewed discussion of these issues in, the, in, in, in light of, of, the, the, of what the new technologies will bring. One of the things that, that innovation does is uh, lower transactions costs. And we go back to sort of the theory of the firm. Why, why, why do firms exist? It's, you know, to, to lower transactions. I think part of what we're seeing on sort of the gig economy and this flexibility is, you know, perhaps we don't need firms a, a, as much as we used to because firms, again, were a mechanism of reducing transactions costs. First of all, do you see that being true? And if so, do we need to rethink things like employment insurance and just and you know job training based on unemployment? Uh, given that the, this wall between you know you're either employed or unemployed, 
might not uh, be as distinct as it was 30 or 40 years ago. I think ago. that's very important and, and clearly uh, so, you know, what people refer to as the gig economy, for instance, as uh, exemplified by Uber, is changing the employment picture. And, uh, but it's making the issue of job security and insurance no less relevant. So I think uh, we definitely need to have a discussion on that. Some of it is, again, regulatory in nature, you know, what counts as the employment contract, and that's going to have some implications. But I think uh, the more important part is exactly like as you've, you've pointed out, what's the role of firms? And I think here the puzzling thing is in some sense that when you think of many of the technologies based on the internet and the information age, they are democratizing in nature. They open the platform to many people and, uh, and, 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 and they, make, uh, they make transaction costs lower, so therefore many more transactions could be, uh, could be carried out. But at the same time, we have never been as dominated by large firms as we are at the moment. So there is clearly some amount of what economists call increasing returns to scale that comes from dominating information that is making companies like Facebook, Google, uh, Microsoft uh, much, much more powerful than any other company in the history of humankind. So I think one important issue here is beyond the employment contract, we also may need to think about regulation. Where does the competitive advantage of many of these companies come from? It comes in part from their technologies, but also in large part from their control of data. So is it totally fine for a company to collect data from its users and use it in a proprietary manner? Or is it the case that in the same way that we shared many other resources, including rail lines, <laughs> some of that data should be shared? And I think uh, that's a discussion that, that we haven't started having yet. Well, I see a lot of people sort of jumping, wanting to ask questions. So here's what we'll do. We've got two <laughs> mics here and here. Uh, so come on up if you uh, want to ask a question. And uh, if you don't, because I've got a lot. Let, let's go back to the skill setting. So this is, I've got a six-year-old and a two-year-old. So this is something I, th I think about a lot of, OK, what skills do they need? Because on the one hand, we do hear a lot of STEMs. And it's like, OK, well, we want to have uh, you know, kids be able to program these robots and repair these robots and come up with code. But at the same time, with AI and machine learning, you know, I also feel like we're getting to a point where the, 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 these machines may, in, in a sense, become self-healing. Or one, one robot will be able to build the next generation of robots. So, First of all, as a parent, how do we figure out what skills we should be teaching our kids? But also, as a school system, as a government, how do we deal with that, not really knowing what the skills of the future are going to going to be? I, mean, I think I think that's the, that's the key question, and and unfortunately, I wish I had a much better answer. And part of the reason why we don't have a better answer to this is because people haven't been asking this question, so we don't even have the data set. Uh, or the sort of measurement and the experiments in order to answer it. What we know is that during this period in which uh, inequality has been increasing because of, uh, partly because of new technologies and, uh, and, 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 and transformation of the workplace, we've had soft skills as we measure in various data sets have actually become more and more valuable. So it's not true that during this time period it's the numeracy skills that have become more rewarded and soft skills have become less important. In fact, if anything, soft skills appear to, become, to have become more important. And I think what that reflects is what's going on in the median, in the middle of the wage distribution. So clearly, if uh, your children, I'm sure, are very, very talented, <laughs> if they have the chance to be an engineer for Google or, or, or Facebook, that's a great occupation, and they're probably going to do much better than uh, anything you can do with, uh, uh, with, with just uh, the sort of the usual sort of skills working with robots or computers if you are very at the very top of the hierarchy in terms of these STEM numeracy skills. But for many of the workers that are going to make up the bulk of the wage distribution, that disappearing middle that I was showing you, I think it's a combination of skills, but also it's the ability to deal with change. I think that what's going to uh, uh, characterize the future is a much more fluid labor market. If you look at the career of a typical worker in the US, uh, and you said, you know, 
who, who is the median worker in the US, for example, who's just in terms of how long he has been in a job? And what you, the answer you would have got in the 1980s is that the typical worker has been in his job for 20 or 20 plus years. He's been rising within the hierarchy of a large company. The, to the products that the company produces don't change. Perhaps the management changes. There are some reorganizations every now and then. But it's a relatively safe environment. And that safety was valued because that's what people's sort of nature is. And we, we did not give them tools for dealing with adversity or changing their uh, what they're doing in a very, very frequent manner. So therefore, that safety was valued even more. But if those sorts of jobs are going to be more and more scarce in the future, then it becomes more imperative that we provide the students uh, or, the, the, or the youth when they are students with the sort of skills that are going to enable them to be more adaptable in, 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 in their prime years. Excellent. So we've got, uh, so we'll go one, two, three. Uh, so keep them short, no, no statements, uh, you know, uh, d you know uh, or questions masquerade as statements. We have robots in the room. They will take you away if you go too long. All right. Uh, my name is uh, Philippe Olivier Giroux. I work for the federal government. Um, something I'd like to ask is take uh, advantage of uh, your expertise in economics and, and your understanding and view of the field. What I'm trying to figure out is to what extent uh, modeling and trying to predict the effect on an unemployment of artificial intelligence and robotics, to what extent would you say the, the, there's reliable models to do that? Like, as somebody working in policy, to what extent should I rely on, I'll, I'll ask you very frankly, on your predictions and your <laughs> colleagues' predictions mm -hmm. to base public policy? My name is Bryson Massey, I'm a freelance journalist, and uh, I basically would love to hear an expansion on why the universal basic income, or your, your uh, 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 the reason why you don't think it's not necessarily the best idea. Okay, UBI. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, well, but also a bit on universal basic income, so I completely understand right now it's just, a, for example, the Danish flex security model could be very interesting in order to increase social security, in order to have a good living wage, but this is still thinking about social inclusion of workers in society only based through wage labor in a society where this wage labor is becoming, well, a bit problematic. It's just, just a curve on the greater than college graduates. Uh, uh, yes, it is increasing, but at the same time, there's a, one of the main factors of inequality right now is what we call skill bias technological change. So even with university education, you can end up with acquiring skills that are just completely not relevant anymore once you arrive uh, on the labor market and you end up with the losers even if you have greater in college education. So, so for me, maybe not universal basic income, but if, having this discussion of how to delink income with Wage product, well, not wage, but labor productivity. I think is something absolutely important that needs to be done one way or the other. And very one very okay. quick question. <laughs> that that was. Okay. So, 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 um, thank you for saying that nature of the firms is not only about reducing trans transaction costs. For me, this is pure nonsense. Uh, the importance of business power in place, especially in a world you mentioned in terms of power over control of data, yes, absolutely. But what, when you look at regulatory capture right now between politics and economics, so basically corporate interests being able to do I'm here. I, I'm hearing the robots. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of scared in terms of the shape of the corporate landscape emerging out of this new world of technology, robotics, and this concentra concentration centralization of information. Excellent. Thank you. Thank so, you. Those are uh, great questions. Let me, uh, I think the last two are sort of uh, very connected, so let me take those two uh, uh, last and then just briefly respond to the first question. I, I think, you know, we don't have great models that you can definitely trust. In fact, that's what I was trying to emphasize, that if you took a model of the labor market that you know, seemed to do re relatively well for the 1970s and the 1980s and apply to the data for the 2000s, it doesn't work very well because the nature of technologies is changing. And uh, our ability to know what the future holds is of course hampered by two things. Uh, we don't know what future technologies are going to be and we don't know what their implications are going to be. So for example, uh, you know, a very well publicized paper by 
uh, two Oxford academics, Frey and Osborne, uh, sort of created these uh, scores or probabilities of which jobs are going to get automated. Well, that's entirely based on projecting what we know in terms of technology today well into the future, which is very, very fraught, and I think you're not going to, uh, you're not going to want to attach much confidence on such numbers. But even if those numbers were true, what their implications for labor, wages, employment, that's where you need the economic modeling. And, and that there are a lot of uncertainties. But the best that we can do is really look at what the sort of research that I was uh, quickly summarizing, look at types of technologies that are representative, as representative as we can be, of what the future holds, such as robots or AI, and look at what, ha what has happened when they have been rolled out. And again, that's no, uh, there's no guarantee that the future will play out exactly like that, and, and, and my discussion of the British Industrial Revolution was exactly that, that the early implications of the power looms were very different than their later implications, but there is no substitute for really looking at the data and trying to understand what the labor market is going to do in response to these new technological opportunities. In terms of uh, universal basic income, I think uh, that's a very important question. It's a debate well worth having. And, uh, and I'm not going to say that uh, universal basic income is definitely a bad idea. But what I suspect is that there are two reasons why it is not the best we can do. And I think both of those are important and need to be debated and thought through more, uh, more seriously. And they relate to the second question that was asked. The first one is that I think uh, economists sometimes think in a simplifying way that all we care about is, uh, is, is, is income and, uh, and, 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 and work is something we do just to get income and might even eat into leisure time. And that's, there's some degree to that that's, that's true. But also for a vast majority of people, they define themselves through their work. So I think... Uh, it is a very dystopian world in which large numbers of people stay at home and play video games and just live on a universal basic income. I think it is a very dangerous feature in the same way that it is very difficult to get a country in which nobody pays taxes, uh, say like in Saudi Arabia, but then you actually expect them to be citizens. That's not going to work very well. It's going to be also very difficult where people don't do anything productive, but you expect them to do citizens. So that's why I think the more optimistic scenario is one in which we find a way of leveraging policy and technology together to create jobs. And I think that goes to the question that the, sec the, the, uh, the, 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 the last question. And that's better than just providing a handout in the form of a universal basic income. And then the second thing is that, but I don't doubt that we do need to redistribute. But when we need to redistribute, I think universal basic income is not an efficient way of doing that. Because why should we be giving universal basic income to Bill Gates? and Sergey Brin. Mm -hmm. I think the taxes are expensive. It's difficult to raise taxes. It's difficult to collect taxes. We should direct the resources to the people who are in most need, which is the sort of the, 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 the driving force of the classic social, you know, social safety net, which is that you find a way of, uh, in a way to channel the resources to the per people who are most in need without creating this incentive. And I don't see any reason for changing that big trade-off and moving to a universal basic income. We just need to find the right way to redistribute and make the redistribution generous enough that people can bounce back from uh, adverse consequences that they will often suffer. Well, we'll take uh, three more questions. One, two, three. And again, we'll keep them uh, nice and tight. Hi, uh, my name is Teresa Trollope. I work at the Canadian Museum of History uh, as a program interpreter and hostess. And I'd just like to point out or to observe that uh, the old and the new will always coexist. So there will be people engaged in the, the newer technologies, and there will be those who will maintain the older knowledge base. And both are valuable. Uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, having redundant technologies or maintaining the knowledge of, say, uh, um, working iron by hand. Um, so if you'd like to comment on uh, those issues. Okay, number two. Hi, my name is Siddhartha Kumar. Uh, my question is, how does government and innovation work? Are they friends? Are they 
Like, <laughs> is, does, is, uh, I, I, I'd like to think so, but I'm not an unbiased observer. Okay. Yeah, because innovation, uh, while I just, you know, forum like this does show that the government is encouraging, but then, you know, uh, when we see Uber and then City Hall is always jostling about the new, you know, change in the rules, you know, automated car and all that. So where does government, and uh, is government innovative enough to, uh, you know, uh, face those challenges or be equipped to deal with them? Thank you. Great question. Um, if you got to be dictator for a day, <laughs> what is uh, one change you would make in the US? <laughs> <laughs> oh, better you than me, okay. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, well, let me uh, start with the old and the new. Yes, absolutely, and I think that is very important to note, and that's the reason why I don't believe that robots are going to, AI is going to take away all of the jobs. Many, many things that humans do and will continue to do and new ones that they will invent will be outside the capabilities of robots. And, uh, and I don't, I, I think some of it is old, you know, uh, by uh, creating a piece of art or uh, counseling, things that are very much human base that are that have been going for for centuries are going to continue and in fact uh, when I talked about the productivity effect how you uh, you know when you increase the uh, reduce the cost of autos you're going to want to consume more of everything well that actually acts often in a non-neutral way and that's what sometimes mm -hmm. is called in, in economics the Bommel's disease but it's actually not a disease it's actually a great, quite good thing and Bommel's disease refers to the fact that productivity is not going to improve the same in every sector so if healthcare does not have as much productivity improvements or if education does not have as much productivity improvements as manufacturing then the prices of those things is going to increase and those increased prices are going to attract more labor in order to increase quantities in that sector. So therefore, Bomo's disease, even though the name says disease, is actually quite a good thing because it points out how we can create employment in relatively high value added sectors in an age when there are improvements in the manufacturing sector. About uh, government and uh, innovation. I think that's a great question, and the picture is a very complex one. If you look at many of the important technologies of our current age, foundational work has been done in conjunction, sometimes with direct support, sometimes with direct involvement of the government. The uh, uh, healthcare is the most obvious example where pretty much no important innovation has been without funding of the government. But the same is true for the internet, the same is true for self-driving cars, the same is true for sensors. So government's role is absolutely central. However, it is also important to bear in mind that throughout most of humanity, the state's power has had a much more complex uh, relationship with innovation. Many despots, many dictators, and some elected governments have feared uh, technology and have not always been welcoming to it. And I think part of the reason why it's so central, so critical for us to have an informed debate about AI and robotics is because the, uh, the, the worst case scenario is not, in my opinion, that you know, robots are going to come and destroy the jobs. But the worst case scenario, destroy work for everybody, the worst case scenario is that we are going to destroy the robots. And uh, if you keep on doing nothing, exactly the same cycle as we've had for globalization could happen for robots, which is that for globalization, for a long time, we did not make an effort to make the gains shared. And that led to a huge uh, populist uh, right-wing populist often, but sometimes left-wing populist, uh, rise that, for example, brought uh, Brexit and worse, brought Trump to power in the United States. And now many of those globalization sort of uh, treaties are being torn apart and there are uh, very worrying policy changes in every dimension from climate to international cooperation. Well, if we do the same for robots that we don't really deal with their consequences, I think the, the chances that there could be a backlash against technology is a real one, and we've experienced that throughout history, including during the Industrial Revolution many times. So I think that's uh, uh, 
uh, that's, uh, that's, that's something that we have to really take into account. I think if I were a dictator for one day, I would want to resign immediately because I think the only way we can deal with the problems that we have here is as a society, not with the dictatorial power of one single individual. I think it's very difficult to make sort of the democratic system work, but I think Canada gives us hope. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Daron, great comment uh, to end uh, your discussion on. Um, good afternoon. My name is uh, Barb Stymist, and I'm the current chair of the board of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. And I did follow the very big shoes of David Dodge, um, in whom this uh, lecture that we all participated in today is, is named. So I do hope that all of you enjoyed it as much as I did. I think that. Uh, uh, we've all learned a lot. Um, thank you, too, to Mike for um, his uh, uh, leading us through um, his views and uh, for leading us in the, in the quite vibrant Q&A. Um, I think, uh, for those of you who don't know CIFAR, we bring together um, about 400 of the world's best researchers, uh, Darren and his, Daron and his colleagues, and they are from all over the world doing equally fascinating work. And we bring them into networks that allow them to share their insights and to build more and more insights together. Um, so this very secret sauce um, is creating uh, world, world knowledge that I think will better mankind. And you had a little bit of an insight today. And I think as the individual researchers come together, they learn from one another. And I think it's this sort of catalytic nature of, of what we do at, at CIFAR uh, that will allow us uh, to continue to contribute uh, to solving the world's greatest problems. If you'd like to know more about uh, CIFAR and stay in touch, um, and to find out what our fellows are doing. I think many of you um, will see our REACH magazine on your chairs. I encourage you to read it. It tells you how to stay in contact with us. We are delighted to be here in Ottawa. We do events uh, around the world, mainly in Canada though, and mainly in the main centers. Um, but uh, it's a great pleasure to have such an, uh, an audience here today. I think it's a very diverse audience um, from our nation's capital, and we're all happy to be here on our country's 150th. So thank you for joining us at CIFAR's lecture in honor of David Dodge, and I wish you the best for the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.